Hey everyone, welcome back to this episode. Oh. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Open Source Cafe. Today we're joined by the one and only Guy from uh, Commodore, and uh, Guy also, I believe you recently started your own YouTube channel. I highly recommend you all to check it out. I will 100% link it in the description below. So make sure you follow, go follow, subscribe, and share, and check out the great content. But uh, we're talking about platform engineering today and developer tools and all sorts of things. So before we move forward, Guy, would you like to give yourself a quick intro, share the, with the audience what you do, and also maybe you can tell about a bit about Commodore and what your YouTube channel is about. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Guy Menachem. Uh, I'm a solution architect at Commodore. And in general at Commodore, what we do, we build a developer-first Kubernetes operation and troubleshooting platform uh, basically, we help everyone from developer to DevOps to access, operate, and troubleshoot uh, all the services and resources they have in Kubernetes in a very uh, easy and very uh, sufficient and efficient way. Um, and basically, I started a YouTube channel, I think, six months ago uh, to share a lot of knowledge uh, with the community. I want to make sure that everyone can have some information about what is Kubernetes, how to use it how to make it uh, efficient uh, very easily. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today and share some of our, like my own knowledge and the company knowledge uh, about some interesting stuff and developer platforms in general. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And just on the note of that as well, there's a nice uh, open Kubernetes community by Commodore as well that you can join and uh, yeah, make sure to check out the links in the description. So before we get started uh, uh, with the agenda here, let's talk a little bit more about uh, you know what is an internal developer platform. Yeah, so internal developer platform really allows developer to navigate uh, in their own services, the internal services in the organization and the tools very efficiently. It's a portal that basically connects all the tools, libraries, pipelines, everything that it's relevant for the developers in the day-to-day -day use. Why is that so important? Because we see that in some cases, uh, you may have service that you need to use in, in your own organization. It may be some other service that other team owns. And you want to understand basically what are the services in the organization, which one you can use, which APIs are ready to use, and you can uh, exploit them in order to make your uh, service to run much easier and faster. Um, so what it does, it basically connects all the relevant resources, the repository of the services, the documentation of the services, the API, Swagger files, uh, all the relevant tools, uh, for example, a Kubernetes plugin that can help you to actually monitor and see what you have live running uh, in the cluster. So I would say the art of the internal developer platforms is basically the service catalog. Uh, in the service catalog, this is where you find the relevant information about the services. Um, and what really makes uh, internal developer uh, platform extensive is the ability to use plugins to extend it and make it very self-specific self to any team and any organization. Uh, I would say that in the recent year or two, we can see um, a lot of new tools that uh, gaining adoptions um, in the community and also in commercial uh, offering. So for example, Backstage, which is an open source project started by Spotify and, and contributed to the CNCF, uh, is the most common uh, IDP. So we can see a very big adoption for it in the recent year. And I think it's one of the top two or three uh, projects in the CNCF uh, in terms of velocity. Uh, Besides that, we also see some commercial offering, for example, uh, GetPort.io, which is an internal developer platform, but also um, Ops Level and other tools that allows basically to get service catalog and internal developer platform uh, and use it very, very easily. Amazing. Well, couldn't agree more. And uh, regarding more on the solutions, 
I did a pod a podcast with uh, you know, Zohar from Port.io, uh, also around it. They also shared some pretty interesting uh, approaches. And uh, when we're talking about internal developer platform, can we maybe answer the question like maybe why would someone you know want to create their own uh, developer platform? Yeah, so it's a good question because we talked about the solution, but uh, we want to understand the motivation. Uh, what problems and challenges uh, do we want to face? So I would say that in the recent years, uh, development velocity uh, and dev velocity is a main issue in many teams. Why? Because obviously the business wants to run faster and developers should be focused on create business. And anything that eliminates that from developers to create business value and run faster, um, really uh, not helping the organization to move forward. So, and we find out that basically in order to understand which services they have, what are, where is the documentation, what is the right repo for that specific service? Developers spend a lot of time in order to get this simple information. Uh, for example, you see a service, maybe some other team service, and you want to understand what is the relevant dashboard in Grafana for it. Um, or, for example, we see that in Commodore, that people want to understand what is the relevant Commodore dashboard for this specific service. So we find that developers actually spend a lot of time in order to understand what they have, what they should use, uh, and that brings a lot of velocity into their day-to-day -day life. Um, because services are and microservices architecture making it very complex to understand what you have and where it is. I think the second thing is more about developers' happiness. Uh, we sometimes tend to forget that, but the ability to understand what you have and to navigate faster through your internal team ecosystem, that's really valuable and really makes developer happy. And if you want to get retention of developer over time, that really helps to get that. Uh, obviously, when you onboard a new uh, developer into the organization, you want to onboard them as fast as you can. You want to make sure that if you onboard someone new, they are getting into business as fast as you can. And the ability to make them onboard faster, make them navigate faster, and make them push code faster that's a real KPI that drives the business. Um, and, and I would say that all of these things around velocity, happiness, uh, frustration, and time spent over non-business core activities, that's the main driver for uh, building or adopting uh, your internal developer platform. So you mentioned about like uh, the happiness. You mentioned about the business value, and uh, it's 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 interesting because like developers want to focus on writing code. They want to do. They want to work with like YAML files or infrastructure and all these uh, tools of the landscape and all these other things. So how do you as a company measure the ROI uh, when it, when it comes to you know using these portals? Yes. So. ROI in, uh, in developer, it's a big thing um, because it's very hard to measure, uh, but you do know it, it, it does some impact. Uh, if we're talking about internal developer platform, I think uh, Backstage actually recently uh, posted a very nice post about how do they calculate the ROI of Backstage in many organizations. And I think that for example, dev activity on GitHub. This is something that if your developers are more active on GitHub, writing more code, that really makes the difference. Um, and if you allow them to be more active, and you can see in their report, maybe we can add a link to the description to it, uh, it basically allows to uh, developer to push more code, to do more things, to be more active. And as a side effect, maybe the cause of it, we can see the backstage also look for the pull request count and the cycle time for each issue and pull request. And it's actually shortened the cycle time 
while increasing the PR count, uh, which those are the metrics that are part of the activity, but they are a little bit on the side of the activity. So we want to make sure, first of all, that we have positive activity. We can see increasing PR count and reducing cycle time. That means that we move things much faster. The yeah. next thing is, yeah. for example, about deployment velocity or retention of, of employees. And deployment velocity is obviously related to the cycle time and PR count. And retention of, of employees and developers and DevOps, that really makes a different organization in terms of onboarding, recruiting, and layoffs, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the, the RI metrics that backstage pick to decide. And I think those are very valuable. Yeah, and we talk about implementing it, then in what stage of the organization would you recommend? Ideally, like when you're starting out, let's say smaller smaller teams or or mid-size or like the large uh, larger teams. So does it really benefit uh, every one of those equally or like how would one get started at which so, stage? So, so it's, a, it's a great question because um, most of the problems that we talked about before um, there are things that very small teams, let's say if you have a team of 50 developers and DevOps, like 50 engineers, um, they don't need like a developer platform for it. You can deploy one. It maybe will help you to do some of the things, but the ROI you will get out of it, it's not as good as to create, I don't know, one doc page or managing everything on Slack or Teams or whatever, Discord. Uh, when we are talking about mid-range uh, teams going from Android developers, um, we can see the benefit really kicks in. Why? Because there you have more processes. Uh, you need to put in the knowledge and you need to increase the velocity. And they need to understand a lot of the things, but they don't have where from. So what we see in 20 or 30 engineers they are not the problems that you see in 100 engineering uh, team. And obviously, when we are talking about hundreds and thousands of engineering teams for big organization or enterprise, it's a main difference because sometimes in order to understand a very simple question like, where is this dashboard? What is the right service? How do I use this API? They need to talk with a few people from other teams, other departments, other business units. Uh, and sometimes it takes them months only to get a very simple uh, question that with IDP uh, or with any platform they have internally, they will be able to get it faster. So I would say small one, it's not really the use case. From mid one, we can see it adopted, but in big organization enterprise, this is the sweet spot. This is if you are in a big company or enterprise, you need to think, why am I not like adopting any uh, internal developer platform today or in the next year? So I've, I've been seeing a lot of uh, noise around uh, you know platform engineering now. So what happened all of a sudden? Like maybe if you talk about the times before developer portals, you know, how are people solving the challenges they have today? before the you know idps yeah so platform engineering as you said it's a it's a trending topic it's a trending topic in terms of tool it's a trending topic in terms of roles like people are working there and um, if we take let's say back five or ten years ago which is a, a full history in terms of uh, technology companies and um, i think that first of all everyone got the tribal knowledge uh, tribal knowledge used to rule. You have this someone in the team that really uh, knows everything and everyone would ask him or her what is the answer. Uh, obviously, they were like a services portal, that, but they were very naive. And system used to be less complex because when you add a monolith service, let's say seven or eight years ago, you could have this monolith. Everyone knows how to use it. You have this one page in the portal with all the relevant information, and you would be able to control it with link and some spreadsheets. 
now, uh, when we are talking about the new era of microservices, of tribal knowledge cannot last longer, and links and spreadsheets are not a good solution for everyone, um, and more distributed system added to our industry, now we need to put in something else. Now the challenges actually rise on top of the solution, and we need, in, we need some kind of solution in order to face it. Yeah, and and because I've been seeing this, you know, uh, when, since like uh, KubeCon Valencia, and uh, there there was this booth, is DevOps dead or something? And I don't think it's dead, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, so, so, I mean, that's interesting. And uh, why do you think it's like trending now? And um, yeah, why not? Why not before? Yes. So. Why now is always a question I like I like to ask people uh, uh, during calls because why now really uh, gives you the intent of why we should do it now and why is it urgent for us. So as I said, microservices architecture are now the new standard. If you build your own application and it's not a microservice based, it's a monolith based, it wouldn't last. Uh, so before, like a few years ago, we would see five teams responsible for a single code base, which was a monolith, no microservices, and all the relevant information was in the code. It was a very big code with a lot of models in it, but it was, uh, but five teams were on it and they were on it for years. Now we can see that we have one team can own 10 or 20 services, and that's a big, uh, Thing because you need to manage 20 services instead of managing 20% of one uh, for per team. This is the first thing, the microservices architecture. The second thing is about tools. Like a few years ago, we saw all-in-one solution. Like um, you would need to run your application. Okay, you would buy or implement one tool that will solve all of the problems in the world. They used to be very good because you could implement one tool, but you would not get the benefit uh, of each one of the competitors in different area. Now we see that in many uh, teams, they are adopting like five or 10 tools to help to manage the service uh, in order to face different solution in a very specific way which is going to create a huge benefit in ROI, but it's a very specific. So instead of one tools, each service got 10 tools to use. Exception, manage, exception manager, uh, monitoring, telemetry, metrics, logging, uh, uh, troubleshooting tools, operation tools, uh, documentation, external one, internal one, like all of these kinds of tools, those are must have. Uh, and this is why, like, for example, people are using Commodore. We want to implement a lot of tools into Commodore to allow people to handle this overload of tools and to help them to be much, much faster and efficient. Uh, so those are the two things, the rise of very specific tools. Uh, I think the, the, the last thing is that in order to run your service, uh, a few years before, DevOps would create a manual work for each one of the services. Uh, maybe a manual, maybe copy one, but there is, was a very specific task to do. In here, we can see that in many organizations, the platform way got involved. The DevOps or the SOE want to provide a platform, a solution for developers in order to use it. And if you want to provide this platform, it's... You, you cannot throw a bunch of tools over people. You want to have some tool that will help them to understand what they have, to interact with, and will be the face of the new platform of these platforms and DevOps teams. So I think those are the three main things, like this microservices architecture, the rise of the tools, and the creation of platforms instead of custom-made solutions. And we, you know, we talk about how it benefits developers. Obviously, that's what you know. It's 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 mostly all about. But 
when we talk about it, uh, should developers care or just like be okay, we're using it, we're end users and we don't really care? Yeah, it, it's a good question because developers, they are the main users. Uh, when we are talking about running the business, it is developers. So they are care. They want to get the best out of the services they can get in, inside the organization. So when I was a developer, I always want to get the best out of my DevOps team. Uh, and when a developer is becoming the end users and the consumers of the platform, uh, they actually need to make sure that it's usable for them. They need to investigate, to, to invest time in order to make it better uh, and also work with the platform teams in order to make it the best uh, developer platform uh, they can have inside the organization. So definitely they are not end users. They're actually, I would say, contributors, uh, very involved. And I think they should derive uh, to some point this internal developer platform. All right. And uh, speaking of which, like, to answer the question, you know, is DevOps really dead? And we all know it, it's not, but, but then the main question can be, why do people say, why do some people say that it is, or maybe what do they mean, really? Yeah, it's, you know, like, I think both of us were in a few discussion about uh, this kind of uh, DevOps. Is DevOps dead? Is platform engineering going to... Uh, um, rule the world? I would say my answer is no. Like, I think DevOps is not dead. Uh, I think it just shift of focus. Uh, focus from a custom-made solution into more platform solution. Um, I think that in, in, in the future, like any role that we had in the IT department, there is some movement, there is some improvement. We used to be some IT people or system programmers now it turns into, then it turns into, for example, Linux administrator or some tool administrators and, and then it moved to DevOps. Now you can see that all of the organization are like hiring DevOps and platform engineers. And I would say there is difference between what the role actually mean. It means to do build internal platform or to enable the developer operation side. Uh, but maybe there is a difference in the role name because people maybe will migrate their name from DevOps to platform engineering. And to be honest, uh, I, I saw a few people, a few people and teams do that, just do the same as they do last year, but call it platform engineering. Um, so I don't think it's that. I think it's actually just shifting the phrasing and shifting the focus uh, from previous solution to a really new one. What do you think about it? I, I think it's uh, definitely not an exclusive thing, meaning that it's only elevating what develop what DevOps you know stands for. So it's not like it's replacing. I just think it's like an added like on top, if you can be be, be like something that's all, something that's supporting DevOps and not replacing uh, DevOps is what I think. So I don't think to, to in simple terms like yeah, I don't think DevOps is dead. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And, and we see in our customers in Commodore that they are shifting from one way to the other. Like when we when we, when I started like 18 months ago, we used to meet a lot of DevOps team. And now, now like we are meeting with platform teams and we want to give solution for both, for the DevOps, which sometimes focus on one solution and the platform on the other. Yeah, this has been an interesting discussion. I'm, I'm uh, also going to write a blog on this uh, podcast. So make sure you, you know, check that out. But anyway, um, so we have like, obviously now that we have, let's say platform engineering is booming and everyone is talking about it. Is that really like, let's say if we can, if it's so popular now, is that a job worth pursuing? Now, maybe we can answer this question. Maybe let's say if you're in, if you're uh, in, in DevOps, maybe that can be a different case. Or if you're an SRE or a developer, that can be a different case. Um, so folks who are, who might be interested in like taking it as a career option, what do you what what options do you have for them? Yeah, I think that in general, um, when we are talking about DevOps, uh, they really need to think about how they are going to provide better solution inside the organization. Um, 
if it means that they are going to shift from platform, that's a good move. Uh, so I would say that changing the, the perspective is much more important than changing the name. Because at the end of the day, we do want to provide better solution for our customers. It doesn't matter in which role you are. It can be a developer giving solution to the end users of the, of the solution, or they can also be um, some other solution provided by other users. So I would say, yes, if you're a developer or SRE, people that are not really focused on developers, um, so that's a big difference. And, and it's, the question is, is that you need to think what is your role. If you do want to stay in the developer area or move into a platform area. Amazing. And uh, we talked about so many benefits and stuff. Um, can you maybe share a little bit about some of the challenges that IDPs don't solve? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a good question. We always like to frame things about what they can do and what they cannot do. Um, I would say that uh, they have a lot of capabilities based on integration, but uh, it's focused about their services and they are not focused about, for example, reliability and stability of the services. Why? Because this is not what internal developer platform usually wants to make as the services, the service catalog. When you're creating an internal platform, you may want your people to be helped to make the application more reliable and stable, but it's not the main focus. Uh, in terms of the catalog and the solution that you get out of the box, obviously, uh, when you implement that, uh, it will help you. Also with monitoring uh, and alerting, uh, the developer platform may or may not do that. In, out of the box, it will not. Uh, so you do want to create something custom, or custom on your own solution. Uh, anything related to code, basically, it's not something that internal developer platform will help you with. It will not code for you. Maybe chat GPT will, uh, but internal developer platform will not code for you. Uh, it will not make your code better, beautiful, uh, cleaner, uh, it will not do that. So we need to understand. So when we are thinking about platform, we think about, first of all, what are the challenges inside the organization, the internal, the organiza internal for the organization? Because this is what we want the platform to solve. Do we have a reliability problem? Maybe this backstage can solve it, but I would say not. Um, for example, Commodore is very good for reliability and stability. So what I would like is maybe to pick another tool and, and really integrate and make it involved in the day-to-day -day life of the developers to push it in. So I would say as a IDP solution or developer portal, it's no, but with other solutions, it can be yes for a lot of things. Yeah, I think uh, I couldn't agree more. And uh, if you talk about like, uh, you know, some, uh, so we, we talked about like a lot of challenges it solves. Are, are there any that we might have missed out on? Like if you talk about, let's say, uh, you were talking about monitoring, you were talking about reliability and stability. One more thing that I think is uh, why, why people actually, you know, do such things or such trends come into picture and, uh, you know, all these things. It's in the end, people want to reduce cost, you know. That's why they're doing Kubernetes. That's why you're doing everything. So in the end, it's all about money. So uh, I think that can be one of the other challenges. But apart from that, anything we might have missed out on? Yeah. So I, I think that, as you say, cost reduction is a big concern. Like with every organization that we met with, uh, we asked them, like, why, why do you start to migrate to Kubernetes? And cost is a big thing. Uh, I would say that, learning curve for Kubernetes. Like it's not always about cost because you want to reduce the cost, but then you need to pull all the organization to learn Kubernetes. And we find out in Commodore that in many organization, when someone made a decision, okay, we want to move to Kubernetes, there are many challenges to solve. And this is what we want to help with Commodore about how do we operate Kubernetes? 
How do we access our clusters? How we do troubleshoot much efficiently? So those kind of problems, I think that we are thinking on a day to day. Uh, for example, how do I manage my configuration? Do I use Helm for configuration management? How do I split the configuration between the repos? How do I work with my continuous deployment tool? Those are the challenges that IDP are not focused on solving, but with a good solution they can uh, work on. So for example, in developer, we are going to release a, some integration with Backstage that allow basically to developer get all the insight that Commodore brings them into this internal developer platform out of the box. Um, so when there is places that Backstage will not solve, then another solution will integrate in and make people to use. Uh, I would say that, for example, when we are talking about uh, tooling migration, that's a big issue because when you switch a tool from the other, let's say you are working with one metrics tool and you want to move to the other. Let's say that you have one logging archive and you want to move to the other. Doing the migration on the technical side is can be hard. You need to tra transfer your workloads. You need to migrate a lot of things. You need to make people understand how to use the new tool because if they cannot use it, it's like you did anything. And IDPs and portals can really help you to do the migration and make them go into the same place as they went before, have another tool at the same place, and then switch to the other uh, pretty rapidly. And and when when we are taking about when we are talking about our day to day at Commodore, this is what we're trying to bring. We're trying to bring the ability to do all of the stuff that challenges that facing outside of Kubernetes. And we really want to help everyone to do it. Yeah, because you were mentioning about when I talked about like the challenges IDP doesn't solve. You mentioned about like monitoring and helping to code better. I think when we talk about like some of the challenges with like troubleshooting and things being too complex, definitely Commodore, def, you know, for, for sure helps out in, in that way quite a lot. And if you're someone who's working with a lot of services, a lot of Microsoft and you want more visibility, I uh, highly recommend you checking out uh, Commodore. They have a new uh, desktop app, I think, I know as well, which is uh, pretty cool. So maybe you can share from your point of view, being you know a solution architect, how do you see Commodore and uh, IDPs uh, come together, and how can you know folks who work with developer platforms, uh, what can they get out of Commodore? So I think that in any organization, the ability to operate and troubleshoot things in Kubernetes, it's very important. We see that in terms of ROI for making developers use Kubernetes, migrate faster to Kubernetes, reduce the, reduce the cost in Kubernetes. The main driver is the people and the technology is here, is here to help them. So what Commodore uh, does, it's actually integrate into their day-to-day -day life. So for example, when you deploy a new service and it failed, we want to be there and make sure that you have all the relevant information that will help you to identify that something is wrong, to help you to investigate and understand why is it failed, and obviously suggest you what are the right action needed in order to mitigate the issue. And what we want is to bring all the capabilities that they are the core capabilities of Commodore, making dev work with Kubernetes, operate Kubernetes, do everything they want in Kubernetes, but put it into the uh, developer platform. Then it will create a full solution for developers, DevOps, and SREs inside the organization to actually take control and ownership over their services. So as I mentioned you, that people sometimes don't know uh, what is the right repo, what is the right documentation, how to push a code and how to open a PR for that repo and how to use it much better. When we are talking with Kubernetes, and as you said before, this is not the focus of the developer. They are focused on code, not on YAMLs. Uh, this is exactly where Commodore comes in to solve all the problems and issues and concerns developers got with Kubernetes. So it's like, it's like a glove for IDP make sure that all the Kubernetes concerns 
in terms of developers can be encapsulated in one tool and can be integrated in what they are doing in day to day life. Yeah, yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And uh, thanks a lot for sharing, Guy. It was really great talking to you. And uh, my one final question is like KubeCon is coming up. So do you have any predictions for the sort of trends we're likely to see? Wow, uh, I think there are a lot of cool things to see there. Uh, from the talks, from the solution-like showcase, which I'm going to be there, and I hope we I will be able to uh, meet everyone there. Uh, I think, Kunal, that you have a great talk there uh, with Mark. It's going to be an awesome event. Uh, I would recommend everyone who can't join to join in person, come to say hi. I'm going to be mainly at the Commodore booth. And if you want to schedule a meeting, we can meet. And Kunal, I hope to meet you. Uh, oh, we'll be there. Yeah, yeah. I'll be there, yeah. And I think like it's going to be a very busy, very nice conference. It's like all sold out. I heard the news. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to having some conversations with a lot of people uh, around platform engineering because uh, uh, that's what you know people are talking about these days. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, you'll definitely see some more uh, in-person conference content from me and Commodore. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and uh, yeah, I'll post some nice vlogs and some nice interviews. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right, uh, well, thanks for joining everyone. And this was a great uh, conversation and uh, gave me a really interesting idea of a great blog piece that I'll be writing on the answers that Guy gave. So the blog piece would be out as well with this video. So you can check that out. And lastly, you're gonna get started with Commodore. You can check out the links in the description below. And I've done like a bunch of tutorials on it already. So yeah, and uh, make sure you check out Guy's uh, YouTube channel as well. I'll link it in the title itself. So you can click on the title and it will direct you to Guy's YouTube channel. All right, uh, thanks a lot for sharing Guy and uh, see you at KubeCon. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much, see you at KubeCon.